with their grids of stripes and squares. His paintings resemble playing boards for games not yet invented, or the flags of imaginary countries. But the critic, Arthur Danto, tells us that this artist's name belongs on the shortest of short lists of major painters of our time. The Irish singer Bono has called him a bricklayer of the soul. And the artist himself explained, what I am trying to do is save abstract painting. Welcome to Being There, Slow Art at the Modern. In this presentation, we will discuss the work of Sean Scully, with particular attention paid to one of the jewels in the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth's collection, Scully's Pale Fire from 1988. The modern in Fort Worth is fortunate to have an impressive collection of Scully's work, comprising 34 paintings and 16 works on paper. Especially important is the artist's Catherine series. Each year, from 1979 through 1996, Scully chose and retained for his personal collection what he considered to be a representative painting, which he titled after his then wife, the artist Catherine Lee. The museum acquired the entire Catherine series from the artist in 2001. And the Catherine series allows us to explore Scully's stylistic development over a period of nearly two decades. To understand Scully's art, it is necessary to know something about his background. He was born in Dublin in 1945, but was raised in London from the age of four. According to the critic, Timothy Rubb, the experience of moving to London with his family played a significant role in his formation as an artist and as a person. Facing near poverty and discrimination in England, instilled in Scully a sense of determination, a will to succeed, and perhaps most importantly, a commitment to working against the grain that is essential to understanding his character and the nature of his artistic achievement. Scully's parents expected that he would pursue a trade, and his father, especially, did not support his son's interest in becoming an artist. In an interview with Irving Sandler, Scully explains, I left school at the earliest opportunity. At 15, I worked in the print. I worked as a messenger. I worked in a graphic design studio. I worked on building sites. I did everything. I had many jobs, and I was a kind of teenage adventurer. I had a discotheque that I started up, and that kind of thing. Scully persisted in his desire to become an artist, and after being turned down by 11 art schools, in 1965, he got into the Croydon College of Art, which accepted applicants with no, no qualifications. Scully turned out to be an exemplary student, earning high marks on his A-level exams required for university entrance. In 1968, he was accepted by both Newcastle University and Reading University, and he chose Newcastle because he was allowed to start in the second year of the curriculum. Initially, he lived with his mother's relatives in Durham and drove every day in and out of Newcastle over the Tyne Bridge. The bridges of Newcastle influenced Scully's early overlapping grid paintings, as did a summer trip he took to Morocco in 1969 with a bunch of students from Newcastle. Having spent his first year at Newcastle in the perpetually cloudy north of England, Scully was profoundly impressed by the profusion of brightly colored textiles he saw nearly everywhere in Morocco. He says, I was confronted and immersed by the frantic, relentless patterns of Islam. After seeing on a daily basis for three months thousands of stripes strolling through the streets of Marrakesh, Rabat, and Fez, I was beguiled. When I returned to Newcastle in September, I drove into town over one of the iron bridges 
and determined then and there to make a striped painting. According to Timothy Rugg, Scully considers Soft Ending to be his first striped grid painting and describes the process of making it as systematic and improvisational at the same time. He recalls that he painted this work on unprimed cotton duck in three steps using three colors. I painted regular taped vertical yellow stripes, then I turned the canvas. I didn't really know what I was going to do, so I painted it yellow. And it could have just stayed like that, but the yellow vertical stripes were turned, and they immediately became horizontal. And then I painted the green, because it's easier to paint vertical. And then I turned it again, so that the, at that point, the yellow would have been vertical again. To finish the painting, Scully sprayed on freehand the evenly spaced vertical red stripes with soft edges that sit on the surface and push the yellow and green stripes into the background. Immediately thereafter, Scully made the three paintings which we see here, elaborating on the basic premise of soft ending and producing what he later called super grids. What I was trying to do, he says, was to use the means of order to create disorder, to create visual chaos, to make something that you couldn't really break down analytically. Scully was drawn to the visual effects of Bridget Riley's op art, particularly the low optical hum and the all-over striped pattern. He was also influenced by the pale, lyrical grids of Agnes Martin and music producer Phil Spector's Wall of Sound, where layers are built on top of one another to create a deep, rich complexity. Scully has said, There is a very strong musicality to me. The lines across my paintings are like vibrating strings. Mine was never a question of making a shape. It was always a question of making a rhythm. So my paintings made a visual hum. In 1972, Scully submitted a nine-foot by six-foot acrylic striped piece entitled Red Light to John Moore's Liverpool Exhibition 8 and was awarded a prize of 100 pounds. A memorial scholarship funded a residency at Harvard for him during the 1972-73 academic year, and in November of 1973, the Rowan Gallery in London presented his first solo exhibition, which was a great success. In 1975, Scully was awarded a Harkness Fellowship that enabled him to study in the United States for a period of up to 21 months. He chose New York. By the 1970s, New York had clearly eclipsed Paris as the center of the art world. But also, by the mid-70s, abstraction had been supplanted by minimalism, and Carl André had proclaimed that art excludes the unnecessary. Art had been stripped down to something anonymous, mechanized, and aesthetically austere. When Scully moved to New York, he was once again an immigrant, as he had been when his family moved from Dublin to London. And although he adopted the visual language of his new home, Scully explains that he was a reluctant member. He pushed back against orthodox minimalism and focused his efforts on redefining the future of abstraction. I had decided, Scully explained in a lecture at Oxford University in 1995, that what had been stripped out of painting, that is, the ability to make relationships, to be metaphorical and reverential, spiritual, poetic, all those things, and aspects of human nature, had to be put back in if painting was to go forward. Scully's early works in New York were starkly minimal, dense, hermetic compositions of thin, hard-edged stripes 
painted in brown, black, and gray, as we can see here with Catherine 1979 and with Catherine 1980. I was obsessed by conceptual, minimal work, Scully says, and thought it was the best art being made at the time, and still do. But by 1980, I'd finished with that idea and rebelled. I thought, somebody's got to do something to kick some life back into abstract painting. Otherwise, we might as well just give it up. As we have seen, Scully is deeply influenced by his environment, as evidenced by the bridges of Newcastle, the stripes of Morocco, and later, the colors and light of Mexico. His experiences living in New York City are reflected in backs and fronts. Scully says, I was thinking of figures in a line pushed together, and of course, it has a natural correspondence visually with the urban skyline. This piece represents a crucial transition for Scully. He moves from the tight minimalist grids of the late 1970s into fields of broad colored stripes. This 20 foot long piece is a combination of 12 canvases of unexpected colors, red on gold, black on blue, white on red, blue on pink, slapped together, just like New York. Each panel is bold and declarative. According to Scully, backs and fronts was misordering order and a declaration of everything I was going to do afterwards. I am still very interested, he said, in disharmony, because I want the painting to be unresolved, but not unresolvable. I want the pay per person looking at it to try and put it together. I'm interested in all the new ways of thinking about how things fit together in the world. In the 1980s, Scully moved from acrylic to oil paint, using a wet-on-wet -wet technique. Unlike the razor-sharp, precise lines in his earlier works, the brush stroke remains visible, and the final coloration is created directly on the support as a result of multiple overpaintings. His colors are deep and complicated, and some are making their first ever appearance on the planet. None of his colors are ready-made, and nothing goes on straight from the tube. Because he works wet on wet, the colors are constantly being altered by their interaction with other colors. He believes that if colors are simply bright and accessible, they do not hold the viewer's attention for very long. As we can see in Catherine 1985, the joints are drawn irregularly between individual color fields and suggest organic transitions between color blocks, imbuing the picture with spontaneity and vitality as the striped sections push and pull against each other in a visual rhythm across the canvas. Let's take a look now at Pale Fire. In the preface to Sean Scully, The Shape of Ideas, the catalog for the show of the same name, which opens at the Modern later this month, the Modern's director, Marla Price, explains how the museum acquired this important piece. Price first met Scully in 1988, and following lunch with the artist, they visited his studio above the cafe. She says, When we adjourned to his studio upstairs after lunch, I found myself surrounded by these large, glorious works, each with its own air of inevitability. That day, I asked to purchase Pale Fire, titled after the 1962 novel by Vladimir Nabokov, for the museum's collection. Sean so showed me the pastel study for the work, and both were soon acquired. Pale Fire consists of two attached canvases with one inset and measures 8 feet by slightly over 12 feet. Many abstract artists have avoided titles in an effort to keep their imagery pure and non-referential. However, Scully's ambition has always been to reanimate abstraction, 
to inject it with the awkwardly beautiful impurities of life, and his titles provide glimpses of the content within his abstractions. Pale Fire is a particularly apt title because the painting captures both the spirit and the structure of the Nabokov novel. The form of the novel is unconventional, as is the painting, with its two attached canvases and the inset. The Nabokov novel consists of a 999-line poem by a fictional poet with a commentary on the poem by a fictional editor. The interrelationships between the poem and the commentary are at once closely connected, yet distant. The fictional editor's commentary does little to explain the poem, but centers on the editor's story that he is exiled in America and is really King Charles from Zembla, who has lost his homeland to usurpers. In the novel, the main character is an outsider, and Scully explains, yeah, he's the foreign guy in America, and I was too when I painted that. He looked at all the weirdness and strangeness of it all, the fitting and the not fitting. That's the subject of my work. Pale Fire is an American-style painting, but it's got a hole in it, with a very hesitant painting stuck in the middle that's very sure of itself. I felt like I was an insert. Like the structure of the Nabokov novel, the painting combines two different but related pictorial structures. As we look at the painting more closely, we notice that the brown ground is overpainted with alternating red and white stripes and interrupted by a single rectangular inset in brown, ochre, and blue stripes, slightly to the left and slightly below center. The inset, which Scully sometimes called a window or an insert, is a kind of puzzle piece that doesn't match up with the other stripes. Scully explains, Pale fire tells of a perfect ground that could be likened to an immaculate American flag, polluted by a dark and uncertain window, which now seems very prophetic. Here is what the critic Deborah Solomon has to say about the inset. Scully's use of the inset challenges the idea of abstract painting as a quest for the perfect whole. In his hands, the pristine forms of geometric abstraction are imbued with intimations of missed connections and broken ideals, thereby carrying abstract art, the house style of modernism, into the postmodern era and beyond. The inset was significant for Scully, and it was a new mode that he explored more frequently in the late 1980s and in the following decade. He placed one or more small panels, typically painted on a separate stretcher, into a larger pictorial field. The insets enabled Scully to prevent the viewer from reading the surface as completely unified. My paintings are constantly making and unmaking relationships, Scully has said, and he expected the viewer to respond alertly to the internal dialectic of his paintings. Here is what he had to say about the painting at a lecture at the Modern in 2004. I named the painting after a novel by Nabokov, and I see it as a beautiful American pictorial landscape with a dark window, a problematic window. A window normally is a vista out. This is a window that reverses the dialogue so that the wall, the facade, the frame around the ochre, brown, and blue inset, narrowly striped, is in fact the area that is lit up, as if it's lit up a wall full of hope, of optimism, and vertical aggression. The inset is heavy, neurotically drawn, because it's closer, tighter, its colors are more problematic, and more burdened by weight. So in fact, it lives off the light of the outside of the painting. 
Throughout his career, Scully continued to explore the stripe. And in the Wall of Light series, the stripes become bricks or translucent blocks of color. The genesis of the Wall of Light series was a watercolor Scully made in April of 1984 of the ruins of stone walls during his first travels in Mexico. And nearly 15 years later, he painted his first Wall of Light painting. Here we see the modern's Wall of Light Desert Night from 1999. We immediately notice that it is different from the Pale Fire and the earlier works that we've seen in terms of its structure and use of color. Michael Opping, the modern's former chief curator, tells us that previously Scully approached color like a weightlifter, covering his canvases with thick, dense color. He fitted the heavy components of color into each other, ensuring their visual stability. In contrast, the wall of light paintings, although painted in many layers, are deeper, more airy, and the overall field is more precariously balanced. Like the Wall of Light series, the pictorial idea for the Landline series, a photograph of a cliff in Norfolk Scully had taken in 1999, lay fallow for a long period. However, a long and difficult convalescence from an injury to his back in 2012 left Scully seriously weakened and encouraged him because it was less physically taxing, to paint horizontally across the canvas. The Landline series evokes in the viewer the idea of the sublime, and Timothy Rubb suggests that the broadly brushed horizontal stripes stacked one atop another are the most minimal paintings Scully has ever produced. Well into his 70s, Sean Scully continues to be productive, producing watercolors, etchings, lithographs, pastels, aquatints, and sculptures, in addition to canvases. According to Harriet Lloyd Smith, Scully's work fuses the cold, hard-edged rigidity of minimalism with the warm fallibility of humanity, and has, in turn, reformed the very spirit of abstraction. And according to Scully, his mission is to rescue abstraction from the abstract. Well, thank you for joining this presentation on the art of Sean Scully. We hope it, it has added to your enjoyment of this important artist's works, and we look forward to seeing you in the museum soon. <laughs>